Thank you. Um, so, some thoughts about peer review, pre or post, or actually pre and post. Peer review is trying to make more research true. It's trying to uh, get rid of false claims. It's trying to get rid of uh, claims that are out of proportion, that um, uh, hopefully at the end of the day, the final product that is communicated and disseminated is more trustworthy, more useful, uh, better in many ways. Where do we intervene? As I mentioned this morning, there is a, a cycle of process in generating scientific ideas, a scientific agenda, and uh, acting upon that agenda to generate study designs, then collect data, uh, write papers, publish them, think about new ideas, uh, and, and so forth. And peer review can happen at all of these stages. There's opportunities that we can improve um, the outcomes of that whole process, which is feeding on its own self at multiple stages. So I don't see peer review as a one-time opportunity that happens when a manuscript is being submitted, but uh, as something that should start as early as possible. Actually, I would argue that if we have continuity of these review efforts across all these stages, probably the, the most likely approach to get uh, the best outcome. Who will do that? Typically, we think of peer review as something happening, as I said, as a one step, um, just when a paper hits uh, an editorial office, uh, uh, one editor plus minus an associate editor plus minus uh, for papers that survive that stage, one, two, uncommonly more than two reviewers would see that. But this is very late. Uh, most of the time, there's many, many other opportunities to try to understand what is being done, why it is being done, how it is going to be done. Uh, so I would argue that trying to improve the methods of any research effort makes far more sense rather than have the methods implemented in a, in a wrong way, in a suboptimal way, and then have the reviewers try to fit something that cannot be salvaged any longer. Um, now, even after a paper has been published, there's many opportunities for peer review uh, for improving what is available. And increasingly, as we get more into the reproducibility era, there's more opportunities of understanding the paper in more depth compared to what has happened again in that one step of uh, uh, peer review at the journal stage. What do we know about pre-publication review? Uh, we have uh, had the peer review congresses run every four years. They're like the Olympic Games since 1989. Uh, for the latest iteration that will be uh, in Chicago in a couple of years, uh, uh, I'm one of the uh, leaders or president of, uh, of the meeting. And if I can synopsize what we know is that peer review is better than having no peer review, uh, but is not really much better than having no peer review. Uh, so th there are some empirical studies that show that, if I were to summarize them, 30% of the papers improve by what we do. Some get worse. The balance between improving and worsening can differ probably across different types of designs and different types of journals. Probably many journals do no peer review to talk off, or they say that they do peer review, but actually what they do is minimal or no peer review. There's tons of predatory journals out there, but even good journals, um, even journals that have the best intentions, they can only do that much. Uh, this is an empirical study that I'm taking this uh, table from uh, BMJ with uh, Sally Hopwell and uh, uh, the late uh, Doug Altman, where they looked at randomized trials, so you know, seemingly designs that would have attracted uh, a lot of attention during peer review because they are important as opposed to some flimsy design that has no consequences. And as you can see, review had a positive impact on various aspects of uh, the paper in anywhere between 10, 15, 20, 30% of the time. Um, 
in some aspects, the impact was negative. And also reporting improved, but not necessarily all the times. In some cases, reporting became worse. W one component where things can get worse is when there's additional analysis being requested, which is very tempting because then you just don't have the authors who have ventured very often into the unknown of uh, generating weird analysis, trying to get some fancy results. Then you have the reviewers who add more to that. And of course, these are post hoc and uh, many of them would not be reliable. By having more transparency, we can compare notes between what a paper says and what a protocol says. And again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, for most of the papers that you will see, there's no protocol equivalent. But in some of the top journals, uh, we now have protocols available. We don't even know whether they're the initial variant or an, an iteration. Um, but we're working towards making sure that we have both the initial and iterations. But that will take some time. Ben Goldacre has done this very nice study. Uh, it's the Compare project where he compared protocols for uh, trials published in the top journals like New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, Annals of Internal Medicine, PLOS Medicine, and BMJ, and the publication thereof. And in the vast majority, there were major discrepancies in the primary outcomes of the trial. So the, the very core set of what characterizes a trial was different in the protocol versus the published version. And of course, there was a lot of pushback from the editors when he started sending letters to all of these uh, journals uh, about the trials that had not agreed in the protocol versus uh, paper comparison. Um, some of the arguments were that, well, we tried to improve the trial. Uh, the outcomes were not the best ones. They were not the most clinically relevant. So we, we had to add more outcomes. Uh, and some others were not relevant at all. So we told them to drop these outcomes. But, but then you start seeing that even what should be a, a rigorous study design uh, very easily evaporates into an exploratory study design that is highly subject to the interpretation of the editors and the reviewers uh, and what they want to see, uh, which is a very different world compared to a standardized, rigorous design that we can trust. Can we have more eyes taking a look? at the scientific work in an earlier stage. One solution is preprints. It's uh, opening the uh, papers uh, to the potential peer review of uh, every single scientist who can go to uh, BioArchive uh, or Archive for the Physical Sciences. Uh, now there's more medical equivalents as well. Uh, preprints have been very successful in the physical sciences. They have. Uh, had more than a million papers uh, uh, that were pre-published in archive. It is becoming pretty popular in the biological life sciences through bioarchive. And increasingly, in the last couple of years, we start seeing some efforts to also move uh, the same concept into clinical research. Uh, there were some concerns that, um, well, for clinical research, you cannot really disseminate something without any peer review. Um, which is valid, but then we all know, and it's very obvious that a preprint has not been peer reviewed, but we just uh, release that information for whatever value it has and with the purpose that hopefully it can be improved. So th there's a dramatic increase in the number of, of preprints and um, there's also uh, evidence that these preprints do get published eventually and they do get published in good journals, most of them, obviously with some time lag uh, for most of them. Are they really improved when they get published? I think we have a bit less evidence about that. And uh, again, the evidence suggests that some are improved, many others are not touched at all. The, the fact that, that a preprint is available does not mean that there will be peer review. People will be interested to uh, aggressively peer review it. Uh, let alone that even if there is some peer review, the authors will really respond meaningfully to the comments that they receive. But at least it opens a window of opportunity that it's up to us on how we want to use it. If we have incentives that facilitate peer review 
and people get credit for peer reviewing at different stages, probably we will see more peer review and more meaningful peer review. Uh, currently, there's no credit system that one could uh, uh, write for uh, his or her promotion uh, application that I have uh, peer reviewed so many papers, let alone so many preprints. Independent discussions. This is um, uh, one step later when a paper has been accepted after peer review, much of the problem seems to arise, not necessarily in the low quality of the data, obviously there's lots of that, or in um, the uh, low quality of the analysis, again, there's lots of that, but many papers have reasonably good data and reasonably good analysis. However, when it comes to the discussion, the discussion is a subjective enterprise uh, Richard Horton had published a paper about 20 years ago showing that if you ask the authors of the same paper on whether they agree with the discussion of the paper that they have co-authored, very few people agree with that discussion. Uh, they would all have written it a bit differently if they had full freedom to do that. And uh, this is unavoidable. We, we have different perspectives. We may want to put more emphasis on some aspects rather than others. A discussion usually is a compromise and there's some strong voices or a single strong voice that emerges from that discussion. So along with, uh, with Michael Avedon and uh, George Masher, who are, who are both in anesthesia actually, we propose the concept of independent discussions, meaning that an influential paper, for example, a randomized trial, has a discussion written by the authors, and then instead of having an editorial, you have another set of authors who are knowledgeable in the field and ideally include also a methodologist, write an independent discussion of the paper so then you can compare notes between the original paper and uh, the independent discussion. And there are some rules about how to do that. The independent discussion should focus on stating the main findings, the relation to previous studies, why are there differences or same results compared to prior evidence, uh, are there any additions to knowledge of the subject, weaknesses and strengths in the study, future studies that might be contemplated, and conclusions. And we have applied that already um, in a pilot phase, uh, and one can compare the original discussions versus the independent discussion that can be written for the same paper. Another possibility for peer review is replication studies. Um, this means that um, we take a study for granted, for whatever it is, but then we ask for independent replication. And for some studies, it's very difficult to do. Um, for example, if you have a randomized controlled trial that took 10 years to be run, uh, it's not easy to ask for yet another one that would take another 10 years. But here's one example. This is a, a paper that we published in 2004. I, I'm one of the authors. There's uh, really... Uh, Many, many big names uh, in, in that paper. It's published in the best neurology journal, and it took us about five years to do that meta-analysis of individual level data, combining data from all the investigators in Parkinson's disease genetics that we could identify. Genetics does not take 10 years to run, though. It can be done very quickly. If you have samples, you can run them uh, literally overnight. And um, within two years, uh, there was another paper uh, with exactly the same title other than a not. Uh, so the first paper was uh, UCHL1 is a Parkinson's disease susceptibility gene. The, the next paper was UCHL1 is not a Parkinson's disease susceptibility gene. Um, and this could be done within two years. And now it can be done uh, within minutes, perhaps, for some research projects or within uh, hours uh, or days or, or a few weeks uh, for, for others. Um, we have to incorporate also what we know about different types of research as to understand how easy it is to interfere with peer review and with efforts to replicate. Many studies are what I would call the small data cluster. They have small sample sizes. They have solo silent investigators working on them. People may be cherry picking post hoc the best looking results p-values that are very conservative are enough. There's no registration, no data sharing, and no replication. Clearly, there's plenty of room for better peer review and for replication studies for, for this type of uh, evaluations. There's 
another profile that is typical of big data research that is becoming more common in many medical fields. In that case, we have extremely large data sets that are overpowered. The typical example is electronic health records. Everything is likely to be statistically significant if you have large enough samples. Uh, again, there is a lot of cherry picking, a lot of post hoc analysis. There's idiosyncratic statistical tools that are trying to harness some of that overpower, but they do that in, in ways that are often very suboptimal. Again, no registration, and um, there may be some data sharing, but uh, these data sets are so complex that very often even the primary investigators don't understand what the variables are and what exactly they have done with these data. Or the database uh, may be uh, flying, may be on the fly as we're working on it, new data get, keep added uh, for example, MedScan is a tremendously valid database, but most of the papers that I have seen, you cannot really even reproduce them, reanalyze re them, because in the interval that you were working on them, new data were added, so you need to freeze data uh, again and again. Post-publication review might be better um, if we had raw data available. Um, it, it would mean that uh, we have the ability to analyze uh, everything that was done in the paper. Can a peer reviewer do that in the two weeks that are given for peer review? It's very unlikely uh, unless everything is in place. If everything is in place, maybe it can be done. If also the reviewer is sophisticated, has the right equipment. But how many of you have ever, ever, ever been able to reanalyze a full paper as part of the peer review? Anyone? Not surprisingly, I mean, it, it's not easy to do. But it, it will happen, I believe. Um, along with Peter Doshi and Steve Goodman, we wrote that paper several years ago, trying to present obstacles to having that happen. And I think many of the obstacles have been overcome or will be overcome shortly. For example, 10 years ago, we had to gather 18 top microarray analysts, peer reviewers, um, who would reanalyze the data from 18 papers published in Nature Genetics on microarrays. And it took them several months to do that. They could reanalyze eventually only two of the 18 papers getting the same results. All the others were discrepant or they could not do it for, for various reasons. In the current environment, a recent paper that was published on a reproducibility check um, on papers published in Nature and Science had everything in place, code, data, software, so within 30 minutes, an independent team could reanalyze all 21 studies. So clearly a vast improvement in potential. With this, I come to reproducibility checks, which is the, the new wave. Um, many studies, maybe we cannot reanalyze, but we can run new studies repeating the same sequence of experimental process. Some fields have been revolutionized by this, but this has also led to what I call reproducibility wars. Registration can also help with um, many of the reproducibility efforts. And uh, registration can go a long way uh, to telling us what has happened. Register reports that I mentioned this morning are one type that can facilitate peer review of a different uh, kind. Um, as I show you here, there's more and more papers and more and more journals that are using registered reports uh, so that a paper can be reviewed even before it is populated by data. And uh, the experience so far suggests that most of these papers eventually do get submitted, but we don't know yet whether all of them will get submitted. So I will close with uh, this slide that is a stock exchange uh, of uh, values in science and in research uh, of what people get promoted for and what people uh, get uh, evaluated and rewarded for. Peer review is one line there along with other items like sharing and contribution to education. Currently, it gets no value. Uh, if we really want to improve peer review, we need to change our system to give more value to peer review. Uh, efforts like uh, Pablons are making peer review more visible, I think we need to find ways that people who are good peer reviewers and contribute to various stages of the peer review will get credit for that. If they do get credit, I think we will see higher quality peer reviews. We will see 
real improvements on the quality of the literature. Otherwise, it will be more of a philanthropic contribution to science, and unfortunately, maybe we will not get much of that. So thank you, and I hope we'll have time for questions. <laughs>